Well, good morning. This morning, I have the privilege of preaching uh, for you and in Pastor Jason's place after uh, Easter. And I want to say thank you to Pastor Jason for the opportunity to to uh, share with you this morning. I'm going to put this down, so I'm going to share about that in just a few moments. I love our pastor, and I'm so thankful that God brought he and Jamie to us. Uh, we're just delighted to have them. Aren't you? Isn't it wonderful? We've had such a wonderful, hadn't even been a year yet, and we're so thankful for this. Um, we had them over to our house recently for dinner, and uh, that, was, uh, that was wonderful. But when Jamie and Jason got out of the car, Jason said, We've walked by your house a hundred times. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, did you check our neighborhood out before you moved here? We, you, you know, scoping us out? No, he says, Jamie's parents live a block over. And when we came to visit, we would always take walks and we would always walk past your house. Coincidence? Well, you guys know how I feel about coincidences. I'm, I'm on record. I don't believe there are such things as coincidences. When Apollo 13's module blew up, they had to figure out how to get those astronauts home. There was a young engineer that worked for NASA named Gilroy Chow. Gilroy Chow lives in Mississippi now. And uh, through a mutual friend, I heard this story from him. He was in the room when, as you saw in the movie, they came and dumped all of that stuff on the table. Tubing, duct tape, stuff. And they told those engineers, figure out a way to create a CO2 filter from, this, from these materials or those astronauts are going to die. And they left the room. What the movie doesn't show and what Gilroy Chow told me, the first thing they did was they got down on their knees and prayed. Those engineers, those sharpest minds on the planet, those men who were capable of all kinds of things knew they were beyond their ability. And so, as the story is told, people say, oh, what a nice coincidence they had all of those things on the module. Or what a nice coincidence that those guys could figure out a way to save their life. I don't think so. There was no coincidence. God led them to the way to save the lives of those astronauts. Now, I don't think I believe in coincidence. We have a God who is always at work everywhere. We see that clearly in the passage we're going to look at today, the life of Paul and his friend and co-worker, Titus. So if you have your Bibles, if you would find the passage, find that book that bears his name. We call that activity Providence. What some people call coincidence, we know is much more than just coincidence. In his mammoth book on the subject, John Piper defines the word providence with reference to God as the act of purposefully providing for or sustaining and governing the world. That's providence. But it's not those acts in the world that we're as concerned about as we are those that relate to us personally. And the Apostle Paul and Titus had a personal relationship. We don't know exactly how Titus and Paul met, but it was probably at Antioch when Paul and Barnabas were preaching and teaching the new believers there. We know that because Titus was one of the trusted disciples that they brought with them when they brought the offering to the church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 11, verses 29 and 30. Paul talks about Titus being with them a little later when he writes the letter of Galatians. But it was no accident and it was no coincidence that God brought them together. They would have a long history together that would span the rest of Paul's life. So what do we know about this man named Titus? Well, we know he was a believer. Paul says in the fourth verse of the passage we're going to read in just a moment that he was his true son in the common faith. He was a Gentile and a key convert to show how Gentiles had received the gospel to those that were living in Jerusalem and other places as well. Paul took him with him to go to Jerusalem to meet the apostles. He was considered a trusted co-worker and partner with Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we know that he was a man of integrity. 
Because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 18, that he did not take advantage of anyone. And he cared about people. Because Paul talked about his deep love for the people in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 7 and also in chapter 8. And he was a beloved friend. In 2 Corinthians 2 and again in chapter 7, Paul was distressed when he did not find Titus in Troas. And he was greatly encouraged and comforted when Titus arrived to visit him in Macedonia. Have you ever had a friend like that? Someone that, that just by their presence encouraged you and comforted you. Someone that just being around them made you feel stronger. That's who Titus was to the Apostle Paul. And he was trustworthy. He was the one person that Paul trusted to take care of collecting and delivering the offering that was being taken up in Corinth to deliver to the people in Jerusalem that were needed, needing it. And Paul trusted him. Trusted him enough to leave him in a place called Crete where churches had been established but were in dire need of leadership. He left Titus. And trusted him to do that very thing. He was a leader among leaders. So as we open up this book of Titus, as our pastor is going to be preaching through this book in the next several weeks, we are continuing this idea of foundations. And one of the foundations of our faith is this idea of God's providence. We see God's providence in the life of Paul, in the life of Titus. And we see God's providence in these first five verses demonstrated for us so clearly. If you can, would you stand as we read God's Word together? And I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. Titus 1, first five verses. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, in the hope of eternal life that God who cannot lie promised before time began. In his own time, he has revealed his word in the preaching with which I was entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was left undone and as I directed you, to appoint elders in every town. Lord Jesus, help us in this passage and in our lives to see your providence. And I pray that today that would lead us to worship and praise, surrender and service. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. There's no doubt that we see God's providence in the lives of Titus and Paul and the way that he describes himself in this passage. And we begin with this idea of God's purpose. Paul introduces himself in the beginning of this letter, not in terms of his pedigree or his Jewish heritage, but his identity as a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. He introduces himself in the same way in Romans chapter 1. And both of these descriptions point to a sense of purpose. Paul says that purpose was for the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which leads to godliness. In Romans 1.1, Paul simply says it is the gospel of God. But Paul defined himself in terms of God's purpose for his life. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul says, To me, though I am the least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. A little, a little bit later in verse 11, Paul would say this, This was according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's why Paul would later identify himself as the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, how you identify yourself is a big issue in our culture today. For the most part, people identify themselves based on some, something of their own preference or what they think will give them personal fulfillment. But it's all based around themselves. Paul found his identity in a purpose that was greater than himself, a purpose given to him by God himself. 
It was that sense of purpose that guided him, motivated him, and gave him a sense of mission about his life. We should also find our identity in God's purpose for our lives. That's where we will find true fulfillment. That's when we'll find out why we were created in the first place. We may not have the same ministry as Paul, but we can identify with being a servant of God, sent out to a world with faith in Jesus Christ to share with others how they can find that same faith. If we don't have that same sense of purpose, we can find it. And we'll find it in a relationship with Christ as our Savior and Lord. This past February, I had the privilege of attending the commissioning service for 62 new missionaries being sent out by the International Mission Board. It was an amazing experience as Diane and I sat there and there were others from our church that were there as well to be able to, to hear the testimonies of these couples and sometimes solo missionaries being sent out to the world many times in places that we could not name and their, their true names could not be even, even said or broadcast. And each one of those missionaries shared a testimony of God's call in their life and a sense that they had found their purpose by responding to that call. And they knew that that calling and that purpose was going to lead them to a place where people needed to hear the message of Jesus Christ. That's why they were being sent out. It was a wonderful experience to know that we have a part of that. We're a part of that by what we give to the cooperative program, to the Lighting Moon Christmas offering. We, we're a part of that by praying for those missionaries. But we can find that same sense of purpose. We may not be called to go to the nations or go someplace else in the world, but we have that same purpose to be able to share with others the life-giving message of Jesus Christ, to live out a life relating to God through Jesus Christ before the world around us. You can experience God's purpose wherever you go and whatever you may do, just like the Apostle Paul did. That was God's purpose. But then we find God's promise. Look at verse 2. In the hope of eternal life that God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. You see, God's purpose was rooted in a promise that God had made long before. And because it's impossible for God to lie or go back on a promise, it gives us the hope of eternal life. Paul says this promise was proclaimed through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures. Those scriptures for Paul were the law and the prophets and the Psalms. What do we find there about this promise? Well, just a thumbnail sketch. We find the promise that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent in Genesis 3.15. We find the promise that God would bless all the nations of the earth through Abraham and his seed in Genesis 12.3 and 22.15. We find the promise that God would send a prophet like Moses that would speak God's word for everyone in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18. We find the promise that God made to David that one of his descendants one of his offspring would be on the throne of Israel forever and ever in 2 Samuel 7, 16. We find the promise that God would send one born of a virgin who would be God with us in Isaiah 7, 14. We find the promise that those who walked in darkness would see a great light when this child was born, that he would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9, 6. We find the promise that this one who was to come will give hope to the Gentiles in Isaiah 11.10. And we find the promise that God will bring all nations to worship him in Psalm 67 and Psalm 117. All of these promises were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That, that's an example of God's providence. That is God's providence on display. In fact, Josh McDowell says, but the reason that Old Testament prophecy is so important to Christians is that over 300 predictions that establish the messianic identity of Jesus Christ are found there and fulfilled in Christ. Peter Stoner, in his classic book, Science Speaks, calculated that the chance of any man fulfilling just eight of these prophecies, just the eight that I just gave to you, 
even down to the present time, would be one in quad, one in a hundred quadrillion. Now, that number is, is really hard for me to even describe for you. It's 10 to the 17th power. How could someone believe that Jesus just happened to be in the right place at the right time and did all the right things? How could someone even believe that? Now, just to put that in perspective, all right? You don't live a billion seconds until you're 31 years old. So that means all these kids over here, they haven't even lived a billion seconds yet. They're not even 31. To live a trillion seconds, and just think about that in terms of our national debt. Just, just think about that. <laughs> to live a trillion seconds takes 31,710 years. That's at a, a second at a time. 31,710 years. One quadrillion seconds is 31 million years, and 100 quadrillion seconds is 3.1 billion years. And that's ticking off one, two, three, four, a second at a time. Now, that's a long time. You think about what we just sang, th singing a thousand hallelujahs. That's a, that's a thousand hallelujahs a second for, for billions of years. Amen. It's amazing. That's the odds that someone could fulfill just eight of those prophecies. Then Stoner upped the ante, and he found that the odds of any man fulfilling 48 of those 300 Old Testament prophecies jumped to 10 to the 157th power, and I can't even begin to say what that is. That's God's providence. All right, that's his providence in the life of Jesus Christ. That's his providence in sending him to be our Savior. That's his providence in all of those prophecies being fulfilled through Jesus Christ. God's purpose was rooted in God's promise that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And now we see God's plan. Look at verse 3. In his own time... He has revealed his word in the preaching with which I was entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. Paul says it was God's plan to make this truth known, revealing it through the proclamation of his word, the preaching of his word. And Paul said he was entrusted with this word. Isn't that interesting, Pastor Jason, the word entrusted? I mean, I don't know if that's why you gave me this passage, but what a great word, right? We're entrusted. Paul had a deep sense of stewardship when it came to this idea of the gospel. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says that he and others like him should be regarded as stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, most of the time we think about stewardship in terms of financial matters, or things that we own, or things that we have been entrusted with. We think about that with our financial giving. I'm so thankful for the response that our church has made to this entrusted campaign. It's a recognition that what we've been given, we've been given by God. Even this campus, this building, this property has been entrusted to us by God. And we are stewards of that. But there's a deeper sense of that stewardship. It's not just being entrusted with something or some things. It's being entrusted with the message of the gospel. It's, it's that stewardship that is greater than any other. And that's what Paul says. He was entrusted with this word of the gospel to be able to proclaim it to the whole world. We're stewards of all that God has given us, but the greatest stewardship of all is the good news of Jesus Christ that we've been given for the whole world. That is God's plan to get the news of the gospel to the nation. I would submit to you that we're all under the same command. It's the command of the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations in Matthew 28. It's the great challenge to be his witnesses to the uttermost parts of the earth in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And it's the great command 
to love God and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And nothing more loving can we do than to share the good news of Christ with them. That's God's plan. This week is an important week in the life of our family. As some of you know, every year in this time of year, we have a little celebration at our house to recognize and celebrate Jeremiah's life. This year is the 14th anniversary of Jeremiah's accident. And some of you know, because I brought this soccer ball, that it was a soccer ball like this that Jeremiah took to Mozambique with him. His assignment while he was there was to do what we call sports evangelism. Somewhat significant to me that we're doing sports evangelism now, Christian. Sports evangelism right here in our place. And to go to places, villages, where a, a people group named the Monegan people were living. The Monegan people are culturally Muslim, mostly animistic, highly resistant to the gospel. Missionaries had not been able to break into their culture or their people because they were so resistant. But a soccer ball, a soccer ball breaks down walls, doesn't it, Christian? So Jeremiah and the Mozambican pastor would go, and they would drop the soccer ball in the middle of a village, and they'd start playing. And soon they'd have a crowd of kids and young people and adults watching. So they could then share the message of the gospel. This multicolored ball, which those colors can represent parts of the plan of salvation, used to help share the gospel in those places. It was coming back from one of those villages on April the 12th that Jeremiah had an accident on his motorcycle, and he died. He died to bring the message of the gospel to those people because they had never heard it. The last message that Jeremiah preached here before he went to Africa was an interesting message, and the title of it was, Why I'm Going. And at the end of that message, he made a very curious statement. It was curious to me anyway. He made the statement. He says, I'm not going because I have to go. I'm going because I need to go. I've thought about that a lot. What was he talking about? What does he mean? I, I need to go. Now, there were some things in Jeremiah's life that he felt like he needed to work out. And this was part of what was going on in his life. But there was another sense that... He needed to go because he knew people there needed to hear the message. They needed Jesus, and he needed to go and share the message with them. He understood that was God's plan. It's still God's plan. It's God's plan for us. It's God's plan for our church. It's God's plan for the missionaries we send. It's why we have been entrusted with the gospel. It's why what we're doing is so important to continue that work of sharing the gospel. Well, Paul finishes this up by talking about Titus as one of God's people. Thank you, Jeremiah. Appreciate that very much. All right. So Paul introduces Titus finally in verses 4 and 5, and this is what he says. To Titus, my true son in our common faith. And he says in verse 5, The reason I left you in Crete was to set right what was undone, and as I directed you to appoint elders in every town. We come to a conclusion in this passage with this truth, that in God's providence and according to his purpose and his plan, that God will raise up people to fulfill and accomplish that plan. God uses people in his providence to accomplish his work. And so it was with Titus. Paul had the same kinship with Titus that he had with Timothy. He calls both of them his, his children, his sons in the faith. What a great testimony to Paul's investment in their lives, to his influence in their lives that then was going to influence other people's lives as well. And that's how it works. Paul tells Titus he had left him in Crete for a reason. At some point, and we don't know when because it's not told to us in Scripture, at some point, Paul and Titus made a trip to Crete. And while they were there, they preached the gospel. And people in those places began to gather together into a church. And at some point, Paul had to go on his way to con complete and continue his mission. But he left Titus there because he knew Titus was trustworthy. 
and he entrusted him with this task. Find leaders, appoint them in every church. Leaders called elders. And Paul had been doing that since Acts chapter 14. From his very first mission trip, what he would do is he would establish a church in a place and then he would find a good and godly leader and he would put them in charge so that they might be able to care for and lead and, and nurture that church. And they were called elders. And that's what Titus was there to do. It's because of the recognition of this truth that in his providence, God uses people to accomplish his plan. Titus was God's person. And we still see how God does that today. So I have been giving out these little books today. It's called a missions prayer guide. And uh, there's some in the back. There's some on the sides up here, various places. This is simply a prayer guide of people who are from Arizona who are serving overseas internationally in missions or serving here in Arizona in a variety of ways among college students or church planting or doing any number of things. And there's 52 different people, 52 weeks of the year, 52 people that we're just saying, hey, pray for these people this week. Pray for this person this week. It's a recognition that God in his providence uses people to accomplish his plan. And one of the ways that we can be part of that is by praying for these people. So on your way out today, pick one of these up. And remember to pray for the people that God is using in those places. But beyond that, beyond that, ask yourself this question. What does God want me to do? Because we really come to this question, what is our response to God's providence? I mean, it's, it's nice to know that God has a purpose and that God has a, he's fulfilled his promise, that God has a plan, and God uses people. But how does that impact your life? Where does it come into to your personal life? Well, there's three responses I want you to consider today. How do we respond to God's providence? The first one is simply to worship. Worship. When we see how God has worked in the past, we see the marvelous things that God has done, even through people like Gilroy Chow and those engineers, through missionaries like Jeremiah, missionaries like others that are on the field today, we should just give God praise. Just thank God for the, the beautiful way we see his plan unfolding and the way that he is, he is working. It should lead us to worship, to praise God for his plan and purpose in the, our own lives and the lives of others. The second step is to surrender. Simply surrender. Surrender to God's purpose in your life. Surrender to God's plan for what he wants you to do even if it means serving in vacation Bible school. <laughs> Who knows? You may find God can use you in ways that you didn't even know. Amen. Surrender. And then the last thing I'm going to challenge you to do today is take action. Take action. If you haven't been a believer, place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you've never made it public, go public. Through baptism, follow, obey, pray, give, go, serve, share. God's plan and God's providence includes you. It included Titus. It certainly included Paul. And now God's providence includes us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the providence that we see in our own lives, how you supernaturally oversee and provide and take care of things in our lives that we will never even know until eternity. Thank you, Lord, for your purpose that you've given for us. We pray that we would find that purpose in Jesus Christ, in knowing you, following you, and serving you. And Lord, we thank you for the promise you fulfilled through your son Jesus that, Lord, drives us to faith, that, Lord, amazes us and causes us to worship you. And Lord, I thank you for your plan, your plan to use even people like us. <laughs>
And so, Lord, I pray that today we would surrender to that plan and that we would be obedient to take action and do what it is you want us to do. So, Lord, I thank you. Thank you for your glory that's on display in the life of Titus, this book that bears his name, and, Lord, in the world around us. Help us, Lord, as we see that glory on display to give you praise and glory and worship you. In Jesus' name.